Good morning. We're here with Chief Justice Mark Rechtenwald. Um, thanks for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me, Malia. I appreciate it. Tell us about your background. How did you become Chief Justice? I know you've had a long and varied career. Well, I came to Hawaii uh, about 30 years ago. Uh, when I first came here, I worked uh, for one session at the legislature. I also worked as a reporter at uh, United Press International. I went back to the mainland for law school and came back to Hawaii for good in 1986. I worked at the United States District Court as a, a law clerk to uh, Chief Judge Harold Fong. I worked in private practice doing primarily civil litigation, commercial and employment litigation. also worked at the U.S. Attorney's Office. Uh, as an assistant U.S. attorney doing primarily um, prosecutions, federal criminal prosecutions, but also some civil work as well. Uh, in 2003, I guess my career took a, a, a turn, a different turn, something I hadn't anticipated, and I became uh, director of the Department of Commerce and Consumer Affairs. That's the uh, state agency that has responsibility for regulating uh, businesses ranging from the insurance industry to um, state chartered banks to um, the securities industry, a number of different uh, trades and professions are regulated by the department. I came there uh, in 2003, worked in Governor Lingle's administration until 2007 uh, when she appointed me to be a Chief Judge of the Intermediate Court of Appeals. I served there uh, for about two years and uh, went to the Hawaii Supreme Court as an Associate Justice in the spring of 2009 and then became Chief Justice uh, when my predecessor, uh, Ronald Moon, retired in September uh, of 2010. So the natural question is, um, how is the job so far? Are there any surprises? Uh, the job is wonderful. You know, it's um, an opportunity uh, to work with uh, an incredibly dedicated group of judges and staff at the judiciary and uh, our partners in the community, in the bar, uh, at the law school, um, and throughout the community in uh, trying to address some of the very significant problems we have and provide justice for all. I mean, that's our mission, you know, and uh, uh, so uh, probably the thing I like best about the job is the opportunity to work with other people to try to achieve that vision and try to find ways to be more effective and efficient in doing that in a time of, uh, of scarce resources and difficult economic times like we have now. I'd say the biggest surprise in the job has been uh, learning the sheer scope of what we do in the judiciary. Um, I think I, like many people, uh, had always fo focused on the sort of traditional job of adjudicating cases. Um, what I didn't realize, although I'd begun to appreciate it uh, at the Intermediate Court of Appeals, and I've learned that more now through my four years uh, as being a judge, is that we're asked to, and as the job has evolved, so that we do quite a bit more. And I think people uh, have rightfully um, come to expect us to have a role in trying to solve the underlying problems, or, or to the extent that it's appropriate for us to be involved in that process, try to ensure uh, that the underlying issues that led to a case coming to the court in the first place uh, are addressed and that some of the impacts that go along with the case or the process or the issues that we have to handle are mitigated. So that might be uh, a program helping children who are going through a divorce to try to uh, provide them with, with counseling and support uh, to minimize the impacts of that process on them. Uh, to a, pro a program like Hope Probation, which tries to set up uh, incentives um, and support for uh, people who are in the probation system, defendants in the probation system, to get control of a drug problem that might have landed them in trouble with the law in the first place. So really, uh, we do um, quite a bit more than just the traditional um, uh, task of deciding cases. And that's been probably the biggest surprise to me, is just learning the sheer scope of those other of those other um, uh, expectations and duties. So what about the legislature? I know that, that um, through your varied career, you've, you've, run, um, you've met with the legislature on various issues, budget issues. Are you getting enough money to run the judiciary? And how did you do in the 2000 legislature? Well, I think like everyone else, um, you know, the, we, we were affected by the difficult economic times that um, Hawaii's encountered over the last uh, last several years. The uh, two prior uh, fiscal years leading up to the one that we just entered, our budget was reduced by a total of about 13 uh, percent. We had to initiate furloughs, two month, uh, two day a month furloughs of judiciary employees. That uh, resulted in a uh, a loss of about 600,000 hours of employee work time. So. Uh, there were some very significant impacts associated with that in terms of, um, because it came at the same time, because of the economic downturn, it came at the same time as a increased demand for our services through uh, more cases being filed um, and uh, 
Uh, so the, the, the real impact has been in terms of, uh, in some areas, the caseload has increased, delay in, ter in our ability to address cases has increased, and that's obviously a very significant uh, issue. So we went to the legislature and asked uh, for funding to be able to get our employees back to work full time. We're very grateful. They gave us that support, so in this most recent session, uh, we, get, we did receive funding to be able to end the furloughs, and the last furlough day was uh, uh, June 30th, so just passed. Now we're back to work full time. Uh, we're very, very grateful for that. At the same time, uh, the legislature reduced the other areas of our budget, um, our operating budget, by about $2 million. So uh, the austerity uh, that we've had to uh, engage in uh, over the last several years will continue. There's still uh, very difficult economic times and we still have to be uh, very careful in how we manage our budget and identifying uh, and, and being sure that we're uh, using the money in the most efficient and effective way possible. So the difficult times still remain and uh, uh, we have to be very, very vigilant in how we go about uh, using the resources we do have. And then what, did you, what do you see for the future on the funding issue? Is that hard to say right now? Yeah, I think it's difficult to say. I mean, I think, you know, it, it, it seems to me that the economic challenges of the um, last uh, several years, although there are obviously signs, there are encouraging signs of, in the economy, I think they, they certainly are going to uh, require continued discipline, continued caution uh, by the legislature, I would expect, in coming years. So our, our expectation is that when we come back to the legislature in 2012, we'll have to uh, do a very thorough job of uh, explaining and documenting um, our funding requests and explaining why a uh, particular request is necessary. So I think that's very much going to continue. Now, what about the state of the judiciary? We're, you know, we've heard about different uh, challenges in the past. Um, so what did you inherit? What do you plan to do? And what initiatives are you working on to improve things? Well, you know, I think, uh, I think Chief Justice Moon created a very, very strong foundation for me to build on. Um, and um, what I've tried to do, I think, is initially just reach out to throughout the judiciary to our judges, to our staff, and then out to the community as a whole uh, to get their thoughts on how we're doing and where we could improve. I've been doing that now for the last 10 months since I took office. Um, I found great enthusiasm for what we're doing. I found uh, great commitment and dedication on the part of uh, our employees and judges. So that's, I think, a very, very positive uh, thing going forward. And really what uh, I see the challenge as being, in, particularly in the immediate uh, future with these difficult economic times, is identifying ways uh, to achieve our objectives in times of scarce economic resources. So how can we be more efficient in what we're doing and how can we achieve better outcomes given the resources we have? So whether it's uh, moving towards uh, electronic case management and case filing, whether it's programs like Hope Probation. Uh, where we try to uh, find a more effective way uh, to get probationers uh, to overcome their drug problems. Uh, and it's, it has the benefit of being a relatively inexpensive way in, as opposed to uh, jail. Um, try to find ways to achieve the outcomes that people really want, which is solving the underlying problem, getting somebody off drugs and le leading a productive life uh, in the area of uh, impaired driving. Uh, we've been implementing the interlock program. So again, they're uh, trying to uh, create incentives and create a structure where somebody who uh, has had a problem of drinking and driving can change their lives for the better and overcome that problem and at the meantime, and at the same time, have the public protected. So those have really been the areas of emphasis for me going forward to try to identify ways in which we can achieve our objectives uh, more effectively and more efficiently. Now, one of the complaints we hear from the public and lawyers is that um, when when will the state come to modern times and institute electronic filing as the federal courts? And we talk to lawyers, and they say, "Oh, the state's so backwards." So, what what are you what are you doing about that? Well, I think it's a very fair point, um, and uh, uh, Chief Justice Moon had initiated the process of moving us towards an electronic case um, management system. I uh, completely uh, support that effort. And I think it's essential. Uh, to us being achieving what we want to achieve in terms of being able to meet all the objectives I've, I've mentioned to you uh, in a time of scarce resources. So that program, which is called our GIMS, uh, Judiciary Information Management System, uh, has begun rolling out in various parts of the judiciary, most recently in the appellate uh, area. So uh, now lawyers and pro se or self-represented parties can file their briefs um, online any time of the day or night from their office or home. 
Uh, they can serve other parties who've consented to electronic service. They can serve those parties electronically. Uh, the public, not just the parties to the case, has access to our database to get status of cases 24-7. Uh, and that's I think, is a really important innovation because the system makes us uh, both more efficient, us, because we're internally at the judiciary. If the, we can minimize the number of times we have to handle a file, go pick up a file, generate paper, move paper around, we're more efficient. Um, it's more convenient for the parties to be able to file without having to come in and serve and put a document in uh, at our clerk's office, a hard copy document. And I think the other benefit is it makes us more transparent because the information about the cases is available for people to be able to see 24-7 uh, as opposed to having to call the clerk's office, which up until September of last year, you had to call the Supreme Court clerk's office to ask about the status of a case on appeal. So those are all the benefits. We're moving the system now. Uh, the next um, area in which we're going to move the system to is our district court criminal area. And what happens with the system is we go in um, and we work with the employees who work in that area to identify how they're doing their jobs now, how could we design a system that's going to make them more uh, effective and more efficient in their, in their work that's going to address the needs they see on a day-to-day -day basis, design that system, uh, test it, roll it out, and then improve it, and then move to another part of the judiciary. So we've done that now with the appellate system. We're in the process of doing that with our district court criminal system. We then move uh, through our other criminal cases uh, at circuit court and then move to civil and family over the course of the next three to four years. So what about um, the Justice Reinvest uh, Investment Initiative, which was just launched? Can you talk about that, and what do you expect to, res to result from that? I think it, it comes at a, a, you know, really a very, very appropriate time and, and presents a great opportunity for the people of the state. The uh, Justice Reinvestment Initiative, uh, it's uh, uh, funded by the Pew Center, the Department of Justice, and uh, administered by the Council on State Governments uh, here in Hawaii. Uh, the executive branch, uh, judicial branch, and legis legislative branch, in essence, joined together to make a request uh, for funding and a request for assistance from the council and state governments to come in, work with each of our three branches of government, and to, in essence, assess uh, using the data that we have to assess what's happening in our criminal justice system. How effective are we being? What kinds of outcomes are we obtaining? Much as I've been talking about earlier, are we reducing recidivism? The ultimate goal for everyone is to make sure that uh, we enhance public safety to the greatest extent possible. So this project, I think, fits in very well with what we've been doing in terms of hope probation and some of our other programs like Drug Court, which is an intensive team-based treatment-oriented uh, approach to those offenders who aren't able to turn around based even, even with the very strong incentives that hope probation provides, uh, need something even beyond that. Um, that's Drug Court. And these have been, uh, I think we've evolved a series of options or a, a sort of menu of options for how we can try to obtain the best possible results in turning someone's life around who's had a history of drug abuse. So we have a lot to build on, and I think that's really the sort of premise of the Justice Reinvestment Initiative, is to look at what are we doing now, how can we be more efficient, how can we be more effective and get the kinds of results we want which is ensuring that the public, uh, the highest possible level of public safety in a time of, uh, of again, of, of shrinking resources. So I think it's uh, over the course of the next six months, the three branches of government will work uh, with the Council on State Governments to analyze the data, identify possible initiatives, and then make recommendations going into the next legislative session. That'll be good to watch the, the unity going forward on that. That'll be interesting. I think it's very exciting because, again, it's um, obviously each branch has their own role. I mean, we're as a judiciary, we need to uh, obviously be independent in our decision making when cases come before us. But on the level of looking at the system and how we can affect the system or how the system can be structured, I think that's an appropriate role for us to play. And that's what we expect to be playing going forward in this initiative. So as a final question, what do you see as the future vision for the judiciary under your direction? I know we've talked about some things that yeah. are going to happen, but do you want to add anything to that? Well, I think the, the mission is it will remain what it's always been, which is to ensure that there's justice for all in our community. But as I've said, that, um, as always, we'll have the core mission of ensuring that uh, we adjudicate cases in a way that's fair, that's impartial, that's respectful, that's prompt and transparent. But it also means taking on of the broader expectations that have evolved over time to ensure that uh, we're reaching outcomes or that we're able to address the underlying problems when it's appropriate for the judiciary to be involved in that 
in that process to ensure that we're not just running criminal defendants through the system and having them go out and reoffend again. That's not what I think anyone wants. They want a system that's going to, when it's possible, to be able to change the lives of the people who are coming in the system who may have drug problems or other problems and get them on track to being productive citizens. Uh, the public wants a system like a family law system uh, that doesn't um, leave children who are scarred by that system of going through a divorce. Uh, and so we need to, again, try to do everything we can to mitigate the impacts of what's a very difficult time of a family going through a divorce. And so, in other words, to in addition to adjudicating cases, to taking on these, this broader role uh, that's evolved over time, and I think uh, rightly so, to ensure that we're actually uh, delivering or, or have a justice system that works, that delivers results that people expect of a justice system that truly uh, improves our community or, or, or results in outcomes that make life better for everyone in our community. And that, I think, those, the challenge is to meet those broadened expectations in a time of uh, reduced resources. And to do that, I think we have to be effective in what we do. We have to constantly ask ourselves, how can we do it better? Uh, we have to be efficient in using the resources we do have. And uh, that's my commitment going forward. And uh, um, I look forward to working with everyone in the judiciary and our partners throughout the community in achieving that vision. Great. Well, thank you for being accessible to the public and for answering these questions that the, some of the lawyers in the community brought forward and some of the public um, people who wanted to know um, the scoop. And we appreciate your time. And hopefully in the future, we'll have you on again. Absolutely, Malia. Thank you very much for having me. Thank appreciate you so much. It.